from Concord University in Athens, West Virginia. This is Mountain Lion News. This semester at Concord, Professor William Bailey's advanced media class have been working on their various projects to one day show to employers out in the field. One such project, a short film by the name of 314, has caught everyone's attention. The film, written and helmed by junior Ian Jewell, is a psychological thriller. When interviewed about the film, he said it draws inspiration from two films I really enjoyed growing up, Fire in the Sky, which is a true account of the abduction of Travis Walton and Jaws. It's about a guy by the name of Travis Logan who, after an accident, begins to have blackouts and missing time. As the film progresses, it begins to mess with him and drive him pretty crazy. The end result is actually that he's being abducted by aliens. I've had a great crew working with me on this, and I owe them a lot, as this wouldn't be where it is today without them. I've had a blast putting it together, though, and I'm excited for everyone to see it in the coming months. We also got the opportunity to speak with 314's lead actor, Cameron Cook. When asked about the film, Cook said, it's really forced me to get out of my usual zone, which it comes to acting because I've only ever acted in the theater place. It's been an amazing experience, though, and from the little bits that I've seen of it so far, it's a trip. And I can't wait for the people to finally see it. My character is complex, and the supporting cast was fantastic, really pushing me to be better with every scene we shot. The film is currently wrapped with filming and has moved on to post-production, is in the editing phase, and is set to premiere early December or mid-January. Concord University held its Veterans Day observance on November 11th, which featured former prisoner of war and West Virginia native Jessica Lynch as a speaker. Students, faculty, and staff, as well as Athens community members, enjoyed hearing how Lynch overcame her hardships and how her positive perspective and determination helped her survive through her hardships. While Lynch was serving in the United States Army, she was captured on March 23rd of 2003 by Iraqi forces and then rescued on April 1st of that year by United States Special Operations Forces. In addition to being the first person of war since World War II and, first, and the first woman who was successfully rescued, Lynch has received the Bronze Star Medal, the Purple Heart, and the Prisoner of War Medal. If you're in the mood for something fun to ring in this exciting time of year, make your way up to the Fayetteville for the annual Gingerbread Festival. There's nothing better than having breakfast with Santa at the Cathedral Cafe before participating in the second annual gingerbread decorating contest to get into the Christmas spirit. Then enjoy a Christmas craft show, watch a magical Christmas parade, and find so many more fun activities to do at this festive celebration. The festivities kick off Friday, December 6th and run through the whole weekend. For more information, go to info at visitfayetteville.com. Fayetteville's Gingerbread Festival is the event of the season you won't want to miss. When it comes to what's new at the cinema, we turn to MLN's in-house movie critic, Cameron White. Cameron? Thanks, Leia. Hello, and welcome to see you at the cinema. Today, I will be doing something mildly different than usual. To be honest, I really hadn't watched anything recently that was worth reviewing. All the top quality films are either coming out in a couple weeks after filming this or are just being shown, not being shown in my area. So I decided to review films that I have loved and wanted to cover during my time here but couldn't either because of time restraints or because by the time I could review them, they were no longer in theaters. So without f further ado, here is See You at the Cinema Vintage Edition. Let's start this out with the current highest grossing film of all time, if not ever. Here is my review of Avengers Endgame. Endgame was and is directed by the Russo brothers and stars, if not made the careers of Robert Downey Jr., Chris Evans, Scarlett Johansson, Mark Ruffalo, Tom Holland, Chris Pratt, Paul Rudd, Josh Brolin, basically everybody involved in the movie. I'm sure that the assistant to the boom mic operator for this movie is living his dream right now on a private island. And let me say, that is all deserved. This film is incredible and somehow pulled off an ending that had a decade of buildup. 
it somehow still blew the entire world away. Uh, this critic included. I remember that at a certain scene, anyone who has watched this movie with me knows what I'm talking about. I started to become emotional and my eyes started sweating. And someone who I went to the movie with acknowledged that my eyes never sweat while I'm watching movies. And uh, I responded by continuing to sweat profusely from my eyeballs while, so while sobbing. Also, Fat Thor is hilarious. Obviously, Avengers Endgame gets five out of five snaps. That is not all. I know that pretty soon Tom Hanks is going to win over America's hearts once again with his uh, portrayal of Mr. Rogers in A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. But that isn't out yet, so instead how about the documentary on Mr. Rogers that came out at least a year ago. Here is my review of Won't You Be My Neighbor. To be honest, I never grew up with Mr. Rogers. In fact, I don't think I watched PBS that much as a kid or even now as an adult. Uh, my knowledge on the Captain of Cardigans was only through reputation, but after watching this movie, re-watching it, and having an emotional breakthrough about myself and the interpersonal relationships I have with others, I found myself wanting to watch it again. To put this in perspective, I only have a few films that I love so much that I could watch them on repeat at the drop of a hat. Those include the following, A Swiss Army Man, Napoleon Dynamite, most works by the Coen Brothers and Tarantino, and now the Mr. Rogers documentary. If you ever want to make a self-help film about being a better, kinder human being, this is the end product. Documentaries tend to be hit or miss with me, but this one is most certainly a hit. I'm giving Won't You Be My Neighbor five out of five sweaters. <laughs> and for my last review for this episode and this season of Mountain Lion News, here is my review of Peanut Butter Falcon. Peanut Butter Falcon might be the best film of its genre to come along in a long time. I'm not referring to it being a buddy comedy slash drama. No, I am saying that this movie might be one of the best pieces of American folklore ever put on screen. Now, a worthy comparison would be a Mark Twain novel. In fact, Mark Twain is even mentioned in the film. A lot of the success from this film has to come down to casting. Uh, Jake the Snake Roberts, uh, John Brethenall, uh, Bruce Dern, and Dakota Johnson all give wonderful performances. I probably said one of those names wrong, but Shia LaBeouf and Zach Gottstigan really make this movie work. Uh, not only as a brand new group of vagabonds attempting to escape their previous lives, but also as two individuals not only learning to befriend each other, but also learning to rely on one another. Zach truly does an excellent job becoming his character and props to the filmmakers for casting someone with Down Syndrome for a character who has Down Syndrome. I know that seems like an odd thing to give praise for, but so many actors have tried and failed to successfully pull off believable characters with mental health conditions. Uh, Rosie O'Donnell, John Travolta, the list goes on. It is better to cast someone with Down Syndrome if only because it's the better option morally. I'm giving Peanut Butter Falcon five out of five hand caught fish. Well, that's it for this semester. Don't worry, I'll be back. But until then, I might hopefully see you at the cinema. Back to you, ladies. Now it's time to take a look at what's going on in Concord Sports. Joining us in the studio is MLN Sports correspondent Ian Jewell. <laughs> Let's get caught up on how our sports did this past week. Concord's volleyball team finished up their season in an unfortunate three-set sweep by West Liberty this past week. They will finish the season with a 10-21 record, along with a record of 4-12 against conference opponents. Men's soccer also lost their final match of the season, 6-0 at the hands of University of Charleston. The boys will end the season with a 3-12-2 record. Women's basketball has gotten underway as Concord has posted a 2-2 record after their first four games they dropped. Their last game in a tough one against UVA Wise. Madison May finished with 25 points, 6 rebounds along with 8 assists and Riley Fitzwater was a force in the middle as she posted a double-double with 18 points, 12 rebounds and 6 blocks. The Lady Mountain Lions will face Charleston in their home opener on the 23rd. The men also tipped off their season and have started a 2-3 have started 2-3, and three, losing their last two games after beating county rival Bluefield State. Mount Olive defeated the Mount Lions 104-91 in their last matchup. Senior guard Trey Briscoe finished with 20 points, going 4-4 four from, four from the three-point range, while freshman guard Ethan Heller had 18 points to himself, before Concord gets to head home and play Charleston on the 23rd. 
they have a tough task ahead of them with a Division I and Mid-American Conference opponent, Kent State. Football ended their season with a spoiled senior day as a winless Wheeling University would come into Athens and get their first win by defeating the Mountain Lions 27-20. Better luck next year, guys. And in this segment, on a higher note, the Concord Women's Soccer Program, which has been the bright spot of athletics this semester, won the program's first ever conference championship by defeating Fairmont State 2-0. Two, two second half goals propelled the Mountain Lions to victory. The program also placed three players on the all-tournament team in freshman midfielder Michelle Brogdon and junior midfielders Yasmin Mosby and Mira Contillo. Concord will find out their placement in the Division II NCAA tournament as early as this week. Good luck, ladies. As this is my last sports segment of the semester, thank you for watching, and I will see you all next semester. Now it's time for a blast from the past. Here is Mountain Lion News correspondent Austin Harmon with this day in history. Welcome to another episode of This Day in History, where we talk about events that happened on this day, November 24th, in history. So, let's begin. In the year 1807, on this day, Mohawk Chief Joseph Brandt passes away at his home in Burlington, Ontario. Joseph's tribe and many others attempted to maintain neutrality at the beginning of the war, but by 1777, Brandt led his tribe and others into an alliance with Britain. He believed and as many other Native Americans, saw of Great Britain as their last defense against the colonial settlers who were encroaching into their ancestral territory. Following the alliance, Brant led several successful raids throughout the war. Despite their efforts, they lost much of their home and territory near the end of the war and moved to Canada. In 1863, during the Civil War, Union troops captured Lookout Mountain, located southwest of Chattanooga, Tennessee. For nearly two months, the Confederates had pinned the Union Army inside Chattanooga. Though they were unable to surround the city itself, the Army instead occupied Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge to the south and east of the city. In late October, the Union General, Ulysses S. Grant, arrived to take command of the situation. On November 23rd, Grant began to attack the center lines around the city. The next day, part of the Union Army advanced to the peak with 12,000 soldiers against 1,000 Confederate soldiers. The Confederate artillery proved little use, as the hill was so steep, the attackers could not be seen until they appeared near the summit. The Confederates abandoned the mountain by late afternoon. Finally, in 1963, at 12.20 p.m., at a Dallas police station, Jack Ruby shoots to death the alleged assassin of President John F. Kennedy, Lee Harvey Oswald. It was on that infamous day, November 22nd, that President Kennedy was fatally shot while in an open car motorcade throughout the streets of Dallas. Later that day, Oswald was arrested in a movie theater by police and arraigned on November 23rd for the murders of President Kennedy and Officer J.D. Tippett. On November 24th, as Oswald was being brought to the basement of the Dallas police station to be sent to a more secure county jail, Jack Ruby emerged from the crowd and wounded him with a single shot from a concealed 38 revolver. He was instantly detained and charged with first-degree murder. In January 1967, while awaiting a new trial, Ruby died of lung cancer in a Dallas hospital. And that was another episode of This Day in History. Thank you all for listening in, and I hope you all enjoyed my time here on this show. I'm Austin Harmon. Back to you, Leah. Thanks, Austin. And that's all we have time for this week's MLN News. I'm Leah Gilpin. And I'm Ashley Workman. We'll see you next semester.